The fact that the media is giving this guy airtime when right now there are hundreds of thousands of people, including children, in concentration camps, I have absolutely just utter contempt for the fact that this is getting an airplay. Now, in the book, you have him talking. But, ter- but the book is terribly funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm John Tierney. Uh, Welcome to the Museum of Sex. I am here uh, for a discussion of a very unusual book. It's an unauthorized autobiography. It's called Dear Reader. It's the unauthorized autobiography of Kim Jong-il. And and with me is Dear Writer, uh, Michael Malice. Now, Michael, he he brings an interesting background to this. He was was born in Ukraine um, under communist rule, came at a very early age to Brooklyn, and uh, he has been a ghostwriter for, uh, for, for um, autobiographies of Brett Michaels, the, the, uh, the rock star, the ultimate fighting champ, Matt Hughes, the comedian D.L. Hugh, uh, Hughesley. Uh, he co-wrote um, a Concierge Confidential. So it must have been different, I imagine, working with Kim Jong-il, <laughs> uh, 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 the dear leader. And I wonder if you could just start by telling us how you got the idea for this book and how you worked with the great man. <laughs> <laughs> well, as Kim Jong-il says, it takes a great man to understand a great man. Uh, that's a quote from the book. No, I, I was working on another project uh, and it wasn't going so hot and my friend took me out of the house and, in Arizona and he said, hey, uh, you should write Kim Jong-il's autobiography. And I thought this is just a brilliant idea because he's probably the most famous person uh, out there that uh, would never write his own autobiography, at least not for American audiences. And everyone has an awareness of him, but few people have a knowledge and information about him. So I usually, when I write an autobiography, you work with the person, you interview them, they write, you know, you work together. Obviously, uh, Kim Jong Il uh, was not available to me because I'm not because I'm not Korean and he's deceased. So. <laughs> Uh, these are two big hurdles I had to overcome, but of course, uh, use being magic, it was easy to do. So I actually went to North Korea, uh, and I got stacks and stacks of the propaganda, uh, and I read the entire Western canon as well about North Korea. So I read 60, 60 books, and I used that to adapt it to a first-person narrative of his life, and it mapped out perfectly to a history of North Korea, because he was born in World War II, uh, as North Korea was becoming a country. He died in 2011. So he's like their Forrest Gump. Whenever anything of interest happens in North Korea, Kim Jong-il's there. Uh, they, they claim that even as a child of age three, he was sitting at his father Kim Il-sung's knee and advising him against the wicked Japs. So he's really at every point in time. So when you read this book and you learn his life story, you're actually learning a life history of uh, North Korea and how it got to be the way it is. Now, how much of the prose in the book is uh, uh, of the sentences are actually things he said about, you know, for instance, he compared one of his theories of literature, I believe, it was equivalent to Columbus discovering America. Yes. So and another one of his was, was, was it, it was it was compared to the discovery of fire, I believe. Right, right. <laughs> so it, it's very, uh, uh, there's all these superlatives that they use in the propaganda, which of course every single one of them I cut and pasted because they were just amazing. They compared his uh, college thesis, which was the role of the county in building socialism, hardly groundbreaking work even by their standards, to that was I think comparable to Columbus discovering America. <laughs> Uh, and, and the Copernican Revolution is compared to, I think, his uh, theory of art. Um, so every time they use some profound sense of phrase, of praise, I absolutely use their own language. In fact, one of the books, one of the biographies of him called The People's Leader, they talk about as he grew up, he learned many qualities from the communist guerrillas, including manliness, magnanimity, intelligence, hardworking, and modesty. And th- <laughs> But they ended on modesty, and I'm like, are they taunting us? It, it, so that, that's in there. I have that as a, as a little sidebar of the qualities he learned at his father's knee. Now, did he, um, uh, did you have much stuff in his words, his speeches, or, or, or oh, what did you have to work with? Yeah, them? one of the things people ask me often is, how do you know what he really thought? And the idea that anyone in North Korea could have any doubt what Kim Jong-il <laughs> thought about anything is absolutely abs- as absurd as some of the stories, because he wrote about gymnastics, magic tricks, dance, architecture, the cinema, literature, war, politics, history, uh, cooking, 
Um, apparently, Koreans lack an enzyme, and that's why they have to eat kimchi. Um, <laughs> so, it, it, that it's, was some of his scientific work, I guess. Well, he also <laughs> discovered that a Paleolithic man originated on the Korean peninsula. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, when he told the North Korean archaeologist where to look, that's exactly yeah. where they found the remains. <laughs> what a genius. <laughs> now, um, and I Korean was one of the first languages spoken by man, and Korea was the first government on Earth. Of course. Now, um, how much of this stuff, did, I mean, did you have any sense for how much of this he really believed? Or, uh, we well, do have... People in North Korea believed also because you were there. We do have a great sense of what he really believed for several reasons. Uh, as we saw recently with Kim Jong-un killing his uh, uncle, a lot of high-level people have defected over the years, including the man who invented the term Juche, which is the leading philosophy of North Korea. So many members of his inner circle have fled, uh, you know, because for fear for their lives. And even being wealthy, you know, in North Korea, when you have a gun to your head, you know, it's like the sword of Damocles kind of situation. So we really have a good understanding of, of how he thought. We also, uh, there were several instances where people had hidden tape recorders and they spoke to him. And it's just fascinating to hear his concerns, you know, when he, when he thinks the cameras are off. Well, he's only spoken one sentence in public ever, which is glory to the Korean People's Revolutionary Army. That's the only thing he's ever said in public, just one sentence. So now everyone here is a uh, world authority on his public speeches. <laughs> but... <laughs> It, what's terrifying, and his son, of course, uh, de defected, but what's terrifying is, you know, during the famine in the 90s, which, you know, devastated the economy and the country, he's concerned that the Korean breed of dog is being driven to extinction. So it, it's, it, it's the, his priorities were very, very clear, Korea, but not the Korean people themselves. Uh, and, and, you know, he put that plan into practice with bloody consequences. Right. Um, now, in the book, you have him talking about that he, that he was upset when he saw famine, that there was just crap, people weren't eating, right. but he then went home and went to, right to work on it, right? Oh yeah, well I mean they claim that he wears those sunglasses because he's bloodshot from staying up all night uh, trying to fix the country. Um, and the famine, there's a big misconception people in America have about Kim Jong-il. This is the one thing I want everyone to understand. Uh, he is despised there. Uh, his father, Kim, it's like this. Let's suppose you met someone from another country, and they said they love American music, and they said they, they love Nancy Sinatra. She's their, she's their favorite artist. She's the best. They love her songs, love her style. And you say, great, what do you think of Frank Sinatra? And they say, who? <laughs> And, and that is how Kim Jong-il is compared to his father, Kim Il-sung. Everything in the country is a function of his father, but most Americans only know the son. And in fact, when Kim Jong-il took over in 94 with his father, Kim Il-sung's death, that's when the famine hit. So he either got the blame or he for causing it or at least not preventing it. So it's very easy to convince an isolated population that they're wealthy and that the world envies them. It's almost impossible to convince someone that they have more food in their plate than they did last year or that their children, you know, aren't starving. So he, there's Propaganda can only go so far, so he is really reviled, and he was aware of this. In fact, you know, he, he cut his teeth on the Korean cinema, which is true, and when the people were cheering for him, he was caught saying, this isn't coming from the bottom of their hearts, this is all fake. So he knew that he was reviled in North Korea, and they called him the gruel lord, you know, because people, at, by the end, they were hopeful to have gruel. They were eating, you know, saccharin just to have something in their stomachs. Um. Now, growing up, um, it, it's very fun. I mean, I, I mean, the book is terrible to read about the, uh, the mind. Terrible? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, no, it's hilarious. <laughs> what is this, NPR? <laughs> yeah. No, it, uh, and, uh, you cut me <laughs> It's terrible as, as far as the Stop saying mind. that. <laughs> but it's, it's a hilarious read is what I'm trying to get to here. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, because he just, you know, he'll be talking about that he, um, he came up with the idea um, in grade school, I think, was <laughs> of self-criticism. Oh, but yes. Then he realized this, and he said he did this, and he didn't realize how popular it would be. I think, right, too, right. You know, yes. so. so one of you know, people don't understand what life is like under totalitarian dictatorship. And one of the most telling things of what it's like is everyone in the country, every single person, starting from grade school, once a week has to engage in a self-criticism session. Uh, you're funneled into a neighborhood group, your, your school, union, something. Everyone's in some group. It's called their organizational life. And once a week, you have to get up in front of all your peers and say, these are the mistakes I made these, this week. And then all your peers get up and denounce you in front of everybody else. And this happens weekly for everyone in the entire country. So we think totalitarianism is kind of like, you know, you, you're forbidden to do certain things or you're, you're not allowed to leave your, your house. There is no element of North Korean life where the people's lives aren't regimented and under the thumb of the state.
street. Uh, and, and you can imagine, you're starting elementary school, you know, how you, in front of your whole school, like your f- friends have to be like, I saw you doing this, everyone's watching everyone else. And what you, kind of stuff will they confess, you know? Well, yeah, it's like I was late for work, or, you know, I wasn't paying attention to this paperwork as much as I should have. Uh, and the thing is, you have to have something to confess. So a lot of times, you know, when you get older, people have a friend and they say, I'll say you did this, you say I did that, because if, you, if you're claiming to be perfect, well, no one's perfect but the great leader and the dear leader and now the marshal. So that's going to bring even worse consequences. And, and the other thing is North Korean is a collectivist society, and punishment is collective. So when bad things happen to you, they happen to your whole family. Uh, so you really have a big gun to your head that you better you know, follow suit, or else you know, mom, dad, sister, cousins will uh, suffer the consequences. And they boast about this, uh, people, you know, constantly. I mean, American politicians, Rick Santorum, uh, everyone's hero, uh, often says the family is the basic unit of society. Well, what that means in practice is if you commit a crime, your family should go to jail. That's what unit means, isn't it? Does he not speak English? Um. <laughs> it's my second language. I don't know. Maybe he should make it his first. Um, oh, did you get a sense from this um, as far as... It's the development of the country and of him. That I mean, growing up, he was the son of uh, of the great leader. Right. I mean, he calls him Marshal and General throughout. I didn't see any dads. In there. Father, yeah. yeah no, yeah. he is. In fact, they boast that his mom always referred to him as General and never as husband. Yeah. Because it's communist, so the the person's role is more important than blood ties. Right. So. Were people terrified of him his whole life then? I mean, it's very funny in school when they says, you know, the professor said, when he takes issue with a professor about something, the professor says, there's nothing with you that I can argue. Yeah, of course. so right. So they claim he revolutionized all the universities uh, while he was at university. It's just an amazing thing. They were not terrified of him growing up because the idea that a son would succeed his father in a communist state is insane. It, it completely flies against all communist propaganda and, and philosophy. And in fact, there was a huge backlash in 1980 when Kim Il Sung uh, named Kim Jong Il as his successor because this was just a complete repudiation of Marxism and, and any kind of uh, you know anti hierarchical society. And it wasn't at all the uh, the case that it was clear that he would uh, take over. As I go into in the book, uh, him and his uncle. Uh, you know, kind of foreshadowing what happened recently, him and his uncle had a little war to see who would take over, and that's the big part of this personality cult around his father, Kim Il-sung, was a consequence of each of them trying to show how loyal they were to the dad who finally settled on the son, and culminating, of course, in that six-story high statue in Pyongyang of Kim Il-sung, which was originally plated in gold until, I believe it was Mao who said, you know, we're communist, maybe a gold icon in the, our capital city <laughs> isn't what we're about, so now it's in bronze, which is much more, you know, tame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and very populist. Now, um, I wondered if you were thinking of a follow-up on this about his, his time management techniques, because he said in college, he, he said he read every classical book of philosophy and everything else. He mastered them all. He mastered every science, every art. Right. Um, he also saw every movie that was out. Sure. Chicken, and, far- chicken farming. And he wrote, it's a great reading list. It's got like chicken farming and... And Gemstones, and, yeah, yeah. and in addition to that, well, call he wrote one thousand four hundred works, including these that were compared to well, Copernicus. That fourteen hundred <laughs> works, I included that because a lot of times people in the states or in the West get the propaganda wrong. He did write 1,400 works in college because they say works, including letters, essays, and, and books. So if that works out to one letter a day, everyone here has written 1,400 <laughs> uh, works over college. So it's a lot of times the propaganda, like for example, they never, the uncle wasn't eaten by dogs. Uh, people are so used to thinking of North Korea as bonkers, and they are bonkers in a sense, but they're not bonkers in the sense that they're unpredictable. Uh, they, are, they very much have a clear, coherent philosophy, which most West Western uh, people do not have an understanding of, including people in the media, which is unfortunate. So part of what I had put forward in this book is once you read it, you will understand why they do what they do. And it kind of reads like a murder mystery. We know who the victims are, the North Korean people. We know who the perpetrators are. And now you find out their motive and their means and how they you know, took this proud country and just drove it into the ground into mm-hmm. the least free state on earth. Would you want to give a real quick summary of, 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 of how they did that? I mean, as far as the... Uh, the philosophy that led to that. The, well, I mean, it's 400 pages. Right, I mean, right. the, the quick summary. The quick summary. Well, well, this is television. Here. Come on, now. <laughs> they. Pr- I mean, how did that I'll philosophy one lead to it? I'll yeah. give it to you one sentence. They practiced what they preached. Mm-hmm. They practiced what they preached when they said nothing beyond the state. 
that everyone lives as a function of their society, and when that philosophy is coherently and perfectly put into practice, and the leader is the embodiment of the people, and only the leader has true life, and your life is a function of defending the leader. Once those ideas are put into practice, this is what you see. You see a nation that has no electricity. You see a nation where children are four inches shorter than South Korea because of malnutrition. Uh, you see a complete you know, Stalinist Orwellian nightmare with concentration camps, because if there's no such thing as human rights, uh, then the idea that you can be sent to, and your family can be sent to a camp makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it, it, uh, people talk about the importance of culture in developing a, a democracy or, or, or a free society, and Korea is, is such an interesting, because it's one country that gets divided, very similar culture, until suddenly th this change happens. Do you have any thoughts about, I mean, I mean what, I mean, uh, how little does it take for something to go wrong for culture to suddenly just uh, degenerate? Well, I, I think a lot of us in the West think that our allies are good guys and our enemies are bad guys. And usually our enemies are bad guys, but sometimes our allies are bad guys too. And South Korea was only a democracy until fairly recently. I mean, late 80s, early 90s. And in fact, in, in, early, uh, in the early 80s, they had their own Tiananmen Square uh, massacre where the U.S. was involved. And the U.S. doesn't deny that they happened. There was this big uprising and they came in with tanks and they started killing students. And, uh, you know, this is something that's kind of been swept under the rug. So a lot of the North Korean propaganda about the South was true. You know, after World War II, the U.S. installed this kind of Sigmund Rhee straw man, and he was overthrown. But there was one uh, kind of dictator after another, the culmination of which, when I read this in North Korean propaganda, I'm like, okay, this isn't true, but it's, it's on Wikipedia. Uh, the, the head of the South Korean CIA assassinated the president and declared himself president, and he became the president. Uh, and it's just like, wait, what? And no, that really happened. The first lady was assassinated, you know? So there was all sorts of you know, horrific things in the South that, you know, we've kind of forgotten, but they share a lot of commonalities. They're extremely xenophobic. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, Korean pride and, and uh, you know, contempt for any kind of, uh, you know, strong racialism uh, and things like that. And so they're not as removed as, as we'd like them to be culturally. Mm -hmm. Politically, of course, it's night and day, and that's a, you know, good metaphor because at night, you know, soul is lit up brightly, and if you look at the NASA map, at night North Korea is just a black void. Mm -hmm. um, but North Korea does have a better opera, thanks to Kim Jong-il, right? <laughs> well, he <laughs> revolutionized the opera. Opera used to be about, uh, you know, nobility and prostitutes, yeah. uh, but now it's for the people. Uh, he invented something called Pang Chang, which is offstage singing, which, that was also Copernicus, I think, they compared to, they kept comparing him to Copernicus, so it, I kind of had to pick and choose the metaphor. Discovery of Fire, Copernicus, and Columbus were the big ones, yeah. <laughs> But how did the opera work? So basically, you know, in Greek opera, you have the chorus, the choir on stage singing, right, uh, to narrate the thoughts of, of, the, of the protagonist. North Korean opera is completely different because the choir's off stage. So it's <laughs> nothing like the Greek one because they're off stage. It's an operatic revolution. And he actually did this. You know, they had this North Korean opera. They're very, very proud of it. You know, all the operas are about the leader or joining revolution or joining the party. But this was really their, you know, innovative form of art. Yeah. Um, I've never seen one because I, I, I've read 60 books. I, I, I've had enough of their stuff. It's just like, please. <laughs> I can read about it. I don't need to watch The Flower Girl, you know. Um, what was your sense when you were there? Um, I, I was intrigued when you talked about the being in a place like that, which it sounds so awful, that in, in some ways, and it reminded me when I, I was in Poland when I was a communist, and the thing that did surprise me in Poland was, was fairly light communism by things, but it was that it seemed more normal. I, I lost my passport at one point. It was at the hotel, and I thought, oh my God, I'm behind the Iron Curtain without a passport. And nobody really cared, right. the police didn't care. And you, and you found some of that too, is that right, when you were there? It, it, it's a mix of normalcy and, and, and you know, yeah. being in another planet back in time is how I called it. One, one of the things that really, really struck me, uh, and this is kind of a telling anecdote, when I, w I, you know, I was born, as you said, in the Soviet Union, when I was a kid, my mom used to drag me to Century 21, which is this discount clothing store, every, literally every weekend. And I would spend hours there and I'd go mad, you know, and, and re I resented her enormously until I went to North Korea because my guide, you know, was a young woman yeah. and she's probably the equivalent of a millionaire by North Korean standards. She will never be able to buy a nice dress. She will never be able to buy makeup. She will never be able to buy perfume or hand lotion or lipstick because there's none in the whole country. If we don't make it, we don't want it. So it kind of helped me understand that my mom, you know, growing up, she just wanted to look pretty and this was not available to her. So of course it's gonna give her, you know, a kind of a bit of a complex. So what I want people to understand is the people in North Korea are desperately seeking 
a normal human, like, you know, Ayn Rand in, in the 50s spoke before the House American Activities Committee, and she just commented, she goes, it's hard for a people in a free society to understand what it's like to live under a totalitarian dictatorship. She's like, and in a way, it's a good that you don't, you don't understand. Imagine what it's like to live in a nation where human life means nothing less than nothing, and you know it. And yes, you, you visit your mother-in-law, and you have a picnic, and whatever, and you try to have some sense of normalcy, but there's absolutely no humanity whatsoever, and at night, you're waiting for that, you know, door doorbell to ring, or knock on the door, rather, uh, and knowing that anyone can do anything to you at any time, and there's no repercussions for them. So it's, it's, it, they learn to do the dance, but they will never be free, and they know it. And they increasingly know it, and that's really what's scary. Mm -hmm. um, a last question for me. Do you have any predictions for what's going to happen after reading? Um, uh, is there any hope for North Korea in the near future, do you think? Uh, in the near future, no, there's no hope. Uh -huh. um, th there's, there's two points. <laughs> uh, it, there's two points I'll make. One is if we look at the, the slaves post-Civil War, uh, look how horrible it was for them for decades. Mm -hmm. So even if tomorrow the regime vanished, th these people have never seen a computer. Uh, these people, you know, th they have no understanding of history. It's, it's very, very troubling. That's number one. Number two is there was a quote, I think it was uh, Steinbeck or Hemingway, and they said, how did you go bankrupt? And he replied, uh, uh, two ways, gradually and then suddenly. Mm -hmm. Um, so when it happens, it's going to be like dominoes, look at Romania. And in fact, North Korea is very aware of what happened in Romania where Ceausescu was assassinated on TV and they were, are making sure that's not going to happen to them because in these nations when the regime goes down, the leaders are personally murdered. You know, look at Libya, look at uh, Iraq. Uh, so they have a very vested interest, even if they no longer believe in the Juche idea, in maintaining power and making sure nothing ever changes. Mm -hmm. okay. um, open up for some questions now. Has Kim Jong-il ever received a psychiatric evaluation? <laughs> Actually, what's really tragic is he, uh, he, his first wife, who's the mother of his eldest son, she went mad. They sent her abroad to, they exiled her to Moscow for treatment. And also there was, there was other, you know, he drove some people to madness by having them under surveillance 24-7, not allowed to leave their house. So he's even worse than people realize. But no, he's never had psychiatric evaluation. <clears throat> I'm with the Oh, and one more thing. They're against Freudianism. That's part of the list of things they hate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, they're very chaste and ascetic, so any kind of sexuality is very forbidden there. They would not be happy with you here at the Museum of Sex? <laughs> <laughs> they don't care about me because I'm not Korean. Uh, so uh, I'm a lost cause. Uh. As someone with the Ayn Rand Institute, I'm particularly interested in your quotation uh, or, or your familiarity with Ayn Rand, but uh, more than I, that, I own her copy of The Fountainhead. Yeah. <laughs> I do. But I got it from uh, you. particularly curious about how a kid from Brooklyn, and by kid I mean a young fellow, uh, got into this into the first place. I presume from the, the way you talk so intelligently on the subject that you speak the language. And you mean English? No, the other. <laughs> that's your said your second language, your first yeah, language. My first language is Russian. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you? Uh, I understand it. <clears throat> you speak uh, Korean, and did you translate all of this? How did How did you get oh, into that's this? A, that, that's a very good question. How did I, I get I all these? I really books? want to know the essence of. Sure. Aside from just a friend taking you out. Sure. <clears throat> how did all of this evolve? Ayn Rand first. So, uh, okay, so I, well, I, Ayn Rand obviously was a huge influence on me growing up and us having a shared background. You know, Mises and I were born in the same town in Ukraine, Lvov, uh, which is also the, the uh, hometown of, of Masak, of masochism fame. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what that says. It's true. <laughs> Say it. So, um, but We the Living, uh, this, was, this was my We the Living um, because We the Living is from the perspective of the, the, maybe Kira, the protagonist, wasn't an average girl, but certainly a typical or, or regular person living under Stalinism. But here I have it from the other perspective. I have it from the perspective of the guy at the top and what he's implementing and his ideology and why he's doing. And, and to, it, there's something as an author uh, kind of fun having someone reveling in uh, censorship and public executions and all these other things. Because again, they're not apologetic. They own it and they are proud of it and, and they boast about it. So this idea that this, you know, this UN human rights report that came out like, oh my God, this, is, this has been known for decades. 
uh, and even Khrushchev was condemning them, you know, for their wackiness. So Rand was a, you know, We the Living was very much in mind. Uh, in fact, when Rand had this great essay called The Monument Builders and about how these totalitarian dictatorships always build up these great monuments. So when I was there and being taken around to all these monuments, that's all I could think of. Um, but the books are translated into several languages for a couple of reasons. One is the conceit is that everyone in the world is obsessed with the Juche idea and is interested in learning about it. Um, but also because every one of these, uh, you know, self-absorbed little, little dictatorships, you know, feels that they're important and it's like if people want to know about us, we have to give them that uh, availability. We're not going to be the bottleneck that keeps them from learning about the Juche idea, which is the guiding light of the 21st century, as you know. Uh, why don't you explain what that is, the, uh, briefly, the Juche idea? The Juche idea is a word that means smurf. <laughs> because you have Juche gymnastics and Juche architecture and Juche music and Juche opera, and what it amounts to in practice is that which Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung like. What they claim it means is that it's, first of all, they only this year started calling it the Juche philosophy instead of the Juche idea. I don't know where they made the switch. It was always the Juche idea. But the principle is that man is the master of everything and decides everything. Redundant, but that's their, how, they, how they phrase it. So basically that a man is at the highest of values and everything in the world exists only to serve man. And, and you only live as part of a collective. So they have a very coherent and, and clever way of explaining it, which is a little bit like mirror image of Rand. It's like Lewis Carroll meets you know, uh, objectivism, which I go into in the book, which is really kind of fun and fascinating because the deduction just goes in complete opposite directions. But how does that relate to the idea that um, everything has to be Korean and, you know, he talks about the argument when, I, when a professor, an economics teacher, dared to, or gave a lecture and dared to point out that it's better to buy uh, um, from someone who's good at selling apples rather than trying to do everything yourself, basically right. comparative advantage. Right. And he stands up and denounces him and, and th that this can't be right. Well, one of the big denunciation is like the students were learning Russian and they're walking around Pyongyang saying the capital of Moscow, of Russia is Moscow and they're saying this in Russian. He goes, no, you should say the capital of Korea is Pyongyang. The example <laughs> should be Korean. So everything is, 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 so they're ultra, 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 ultra nationalist, right? So they're much closer to fascism than, than they are to communism in, in most senses. Um, so I asked a refugee, I go, if, if this is a philosophy by Koreans for Koreans, why, according to you, would anyone else in the world care? And they never gave that answer. But you're not going to be questioning it when you're told this, when your whole family's at gunpoint. So that's really a big gaping hole uh, in a kind of a big net of gaping holes of their worldview. Um. And there's no Mona Lisa. Uh, oh, the, uh, he hates the Mona Lisa. I asked my mom, I said, why does Kim Jong-il hate the Mona Lisa? And she paused, no doubt remembering her upbringing. She goes, because it's ambiguous. <laughs> and that's right. Art has to have a clear message for all the people. And therefore, it's good art. That's the criterion for good art. How's his golf game? And uh, how's that reconciled with the amount of golf courses in North Korea? I, I believe there's only one golf course in North Korea. Uh, the, the, the funny thing about Kim Jong-il is like a lot of people focus on the supernaturalism. It's more the superhuman aspect, that he's really good at everything. And in, that also serves a purpose. You see all these pictures in newspapers of him visiting factories. That is supposed to tell the people things are bad, but he's on the case. You know? So he's good at everything, and, and it'll be OK. You know, Daddy's here. Speaking yeah, of, uh, uh, I wanted to ask you, I don't know how much time you really spent in North Korea. Five days. Uh, okay, so it's not so much. How do you think people actually uh, change under such a regime, and how do they maintain their humanity? What, what happens to them? Uh, I mean, we, there's lots of parallels. If you look at, like, you know, the, the Jewish Holocaust, you look at slavery, you know, how people try to maintain some kind of semblance of humanity. It's through things, they, they have great senses of humor, which is something that never even entered my head. Uh, they gossip with their friends. You know, you have family bonds that are close. Uh, and it's, again, if you have these criticism sessions, you're encouraged to be a gossip, right? Because you're supposed to be like, oh, did you see what she did? So that is a big kind of, of, of semblance. But again, it's, 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 it, it's the hardest place to maintain your humanity on Earth, especially if, you know, during the famine, I can't even, I, I mean, I can't even wrap my head around it, thank God. Um, any uh, North Korean jokes you want to share? Sure. Um, I asked my guide, I said, uh, tell me a North Korean joke. And she goes, okay. Uh, a guy goes to, uh, uh, 
guy goes to his mom, he goes, hey, I don't want to go to school today, and I give you two good reasons. One, all the kids hate me, and two, all the teachers hate me. And the mom goes, son, you have to go to school today. I'll give you two good reasons. One, you're the principal, and two, you're 35 years old. <laughs> it's funny. And, and it's, the fact that she had one off the cuff, you know, it, 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 it just really, and, oh, and any joke you tell them just about the Japanese, ooh, they love that, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So the, uh, Jap bastards. Is the Jap, the... Well, Kim Jong-il explicitly said that whenever you refer to a foreigner from a country that they hate, which is Japan or America, you don't say American, you say Yank Devil or Jap Bastard. Uh, and in fact, they don't teach them that in World War II, uh, the U.S. and Japan were antagonists because that's kind of hard to explain. Um, so it, it's, you know, we've all, us in Japan have always been conspiring to kind of seize Korea. Um, I, I have two questions. One... Um, my mother went to North Korea with the Asia Society, and she said one of the most bizarre things they did was go to this incredible amusement park, which oh. she said was one of the most amazing amusement parks she'd ever been to in her life. And they seemed to let them speak to the teenagers and 20-somethings that were there. Um, I'm, I had assumed to her that they were plants, but she claims that they managed to have some side conversations, and I wondered, what the hell that was about, given this? Is, I mean, is that all for a Western show? There, there's no way that those weren't plants because you're not allowed to talk to foreigners unless you're really high up. There's a hierarchy there. You have a, um, it's like a kind of like a credit rating. They have a caste system. So, so for someone to be trusted to talk to foreigners, you really have to be very, very trusted. So just any kids is just absolutely impossible. So what's that amusement park for? Well, the amusement parks are for the people, but the people who were there, they knew they were coming, that the Westerners were coming, so of course they were there to have people talk to them. I'm sure their conversations were sincere, but I'm sure these people were pre-screened and told, you know, what to talk about, what not to talk about. And um, secondly, can you, within all of this insanity, can you explain our basketball friend? <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Rodman should have a bullet put in him. <laughs> Anyone who goes on TV and when asked about what about concentration camps says, we have prisons, what's the difference? <laughs> Which in, is in the guise of a rhetorical question, but actually is a question that would have an eight hour answer. Anyone who goes on TV, and I'm not a fan of this president, and who tells the president Kim Jong-un is waiting for your call and challenges the president on behalf of a foreign nation, Anyone who humanizes a regime where the leader kills his own family and the family of his family, I don't care how drunk, crazy, or stupid you are, you are a monster. Uh, this kind of Lillian, Lillian, Lillian Hellman you know, nonsense. So the fact that the media is giving this guy airtime when right now there are hundreds of thousands of people, including children, in concentration camps where men are being sent to mines where their skin will fall off because they will never see, never see sunlight again and have vitamin D deficiency, I have absolutely I just utter contempt for the fact that this is getting an airplay. Now, in the book, you have him talking. But the book is ter but the book is terribly funny. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a gift. It's a gift. <laughs> it is, though. Right. Well, it, it does have great touches, like, like when he's talking about the, the, um, uh, the airplane flight that, that, that was there, and he said that uh, uh, there was a Korean agent accused of it, and he said and that was ridiculous, of course, because if I use someone, I go abduct Japanese right, women. Right. Why don't you tell us about so that? So there's this great, this is a great, great story. And this, the, the, the craziest stuff I left in and I didn't, I didn't change it because it's so crazy that people don't believe it. And they go on Wikipedia like, oh, everything of this is true. In 1988, uh, or Seoul, Seoul was granted the 1988 Olympics. And Kim Jong-il said, hey, wouldn't it be great if North Korea and South Korea co-hosted? And South Korea goes, okay. The Olympics aren't granted to a country, they're granted to a city, which is Seoul, so that doesn't make sense. And it's not for us to share it with you. And he's like, come on. And they're like, that doesn't make any sense. You don't even have any facilities. And he's like, come on. And they're like, no. And he's like, okay. So he sent an agent to put a bomb on one of their airliners. The bomb went, and she got off, her and, her and, her and man. They got off, they were apprehended. They start smoking cyanide-laden cigarettes. He, he died, she did not. She was captured, taken to South Korea. Everyone died. She went on TV. She announced what she had done, mea culpa. 
She was pardoned by the South Korean president because she was brainwashed by Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung. Let me repeat that. A woman went on TV, admitted to blowing up a plane and killing everyone on board, and she received the pardon. Not a commutation. She's walking around now, South Korea, happy as can be. Uh, it would really be like Clinton you know, pardoning Timothy McVeigh. So South Korea is a pretty wacky place. Uh, and that's the, you know, her whole story. She had a book deal here. Uh, you know, so I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's pretty nuts. But then, what did, then how did he respond when he was accused of sending the agent? Oh, him? right. So, I, the, so the point is, uh, Kim Jong-il is not perfect because he has publicly apologized once, which is for the following. For, for years, Japanese citizens were vanishing, you know, from beaches, from shopping malls, and people thought this is North Korea abducting them. But they were, like, random, you know, there's nothing in common. And, of course, a lot of people in the left, uh, in academia, no doubt, said, you guys are ready to believe everything about North Korea. Come on, they're not that crazy. Well, uh, during the famine, uh, the Japanese, in 2001, the Japanese prime minister came to North Korea and Kim Jong-il said, yeah, about all those abductions, <laughs> my bad. Uh, it was one of my people, but they've been punished. It'll never happen again. So will you give us more rice now, please? <laughs> and he's like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, no, this, is, this really happened. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Can we have reparations for World War II? And they're like, no. <laughs> and, and, and the Japanese had so much food that they, were, they didn't have storage space, and they literally threw it in the ocean rather than send it to North Korea after these <laughs> confessions. And Kim Jong-il was like, I don't get it. I apologized. <laughs> It's like, uh, yeah. and that is all true. And so why was he abducting them again, though? He was abducting them to train them to be spies, to teach them Japanese, teach them Japanese mores. And in fact, the woman who bombed the plane when she was caught by the South Korean CIA and she was claiming, insisting she was Japanese, they're like, okay, uh, what street did you grow up on? What was your favorite TV show? What was your favorite candy? And she's like, Kim Jong-il Street? Uh, the <laughs> Kim Jong-il show? I mean, she had no exposure to the rest of the world. How is she going to be able to guess any of these things? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier um, that people were shocked or surprised that uh, the son was selected as a successor. What might they have expected instead? Well, I mean, if you look at every other communist country, they have you know someone who's the head of you know the army or the head of the Korean People's uh, the Workers Party of Korea, which is their you know their their political party. So you know the idea that the son, who wasn't a military figure either, uh, would be taking over this militaristic nation was just completely just whacked. We got, let's get the mic to Andrews. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, do you want to talk more about why they did make that decision? I mean, you, you mentioned about it having to do with loyalty, but um, it's still interesting. Like, what was it? I don't know. Or, is, or do we have to read the book? Well, no, I mean, definitely read the book. Because uh, this is, the, the, one of the, the great things that I learned while writing this book is that all the criticism that is leveled at them, they don't sweep it on the rug. They look at it, they put it out. So when I wrote this book, you get the Western perspective and you get the Northern response. So they look at it, they spell out the Western analysis, and they go, this is why it's wrong. So he owns the fact that this was weird that he was the successor, but he puts it forward as, look at Khrushchev, Look at all these other countries. When you have, look at you know, Bush after Reagan, uh, what's the guy's name after Thatcher, uh, John Major. When you don't have a good successor, the revolution goes to pot. And you know that I'm just like my dad. So it makes sense that we're going to continue through the generations. And in fact, in 94, when Kim Jong-il took over, people think this is a joke when I add it in the book, and it's not. His campaign slogan was, do not expect any change from me. <laughs> That's what the billboards all said. More of the same. More of the same. He's the. It worked. Hundred percent of the vote. <laughs> yeah. But he says in your book now that he does not have concentration camps, though. Right. Right. They 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 don't call them. They're, what North Korea again was recently attacked for concentration camps, and they their answer is, and this is. I can't make this up. We don't use the term political prisoner camps in North Korea, and therefore we don't have them. <laughs> so <laughs> there, that takes care of that. Did you, did you get any sense of uh, the possibility of an underground or a subversion in any sense? Or 
There is it, is it impossible? There, there's no underground whatsoever, but there is subversion in this sense. Uh, when you don't have food, you can't pay your thugs. So you have the border guards between the, the river between North Korea and China, and that's gotten very, very porous because people go over, they, get, they sell ginseng in China and, or whatever they do, then they bring food back, and those guards who are there, they get their cut. So and that's how a lot of information is getting into uh, the DPRK. So that's the, and uh, the subversion is it, they're not believing, they had to change the propaganda. The propaganda used to be, you know, we're the happiest place on earth. Um, but now the propaganda is we're the only ones maintaining Koreanness and we're building like a better future. We're poor, but we're united. So that is a very important shift. And it, again, the, it used to be that they fed everybody and now it's kind of like find your own food. So they, they no longer boast about like we're taking care of you. So these are big changes that they've had to kind of uh, deal with. Why did they, uh, I mean, what happened, um, for a while they were actually doing better economically than South Korea, but then what brought on the famine? Sure, they, they were, you know, South Korea was an agrarian backwater for many, many years. Uh, and North Korea cause had huge, because they played China versus Russia, and they were basically a welfare state. Uh, and, and they got a lot of money, and they're doing well for themselves. And, and, the, and, and the other sense is, when you level an entire country like we did to them during the Korean War, the Fatherland Liberation War, as they call it, it's very easy to get economic growth when you're starting with zero. I mean, it's like 100% economic growth. Now I have a rock, you know? Yeah. So, so the statistics are skewed in that sense. Um, but the famine hit because with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the welfare payments that stopped going to them, uh, and the fact that they were the only communist nation to default in their loans, uh, everyone started to demand getting payment in you know, hard currency, which they did not have. So they lost gasoline shipments. And once you lose gasoline, you lose electricity. And once you lose electricity, you're done. Because they have to have, they're very mountainous regions, so they have to have a lot of fertilizer. So they can't build food. They can't have cars. They, they converted many of their cars to wood burning, uh, which is not a very effective method to move a vehicle. So. <laughs> But I mean, it's funny, we laugh, but I mean, this is the only thing that, that, that wood burning got some people fed. So, I mean, it, it's just really awful. Yes. Uh, it's easy for us to see the flaws since we're outsiders for North Korea, but has writing this book given you any insight into things about the US that we might not be aware of? Oh. <laughs> oh, boy. There is no much. There, <laughs> Okay, I'm on camera. Uh, <laughs> his critiques of US foreign policy are really spot on and fun. <laughs> because when, he, when we all laugh at Kim Il-sung and the stories about him, and I have Kim Jong-il point out, well, in America, they are of the belief that the greatest minds in history all just happen to be lo uh, localized on the East Coast in the 18th century of America, um, and that the Constitution is magic. And also his attack on this kind of American heavy-handedness that we can just go in in any other nation and topple their regime and just leave it a complete ruin. So those were some valid points. But also this, you know, the, the, the propaganda of like, you know, obviously Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung are beatified basically in North Korea, but we have our own secular saints here and Frank, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Lincoln. You know, if anyone, if I had a friend who pointed out that Lincoln, you know, didn't particularly care for ending slavery as long as he preserved the union, something he said constantly and repeatedly and he was called a liar. You know, so it, it's, it, there's a lot a lot, of these, a lot of what they do is not unique to them. It's part of the human condition, and it really is kind of eye-opening. And uh, the whole thing, every politician everywhere probably will say, I'm fighting for you. And that's, you know, that's what they're saying over there, too. Um, I have a question about the, the occasional, well, the rare family reunification days that they allow. Oh, God, aren't those great? What's, what's in it for them? Why do they allow this? I mean, you were talking about porosity before the border patrol and then right. the, the plants and the the carnival there there's this how do they control you can't what watch, you say you can't brother? watch these videos without crying 
Um, so these families were separated as a result of the Korean War, and these people hadn't seen each other for literally decades, like 30 years, 40 years. They had no word from each other, and they kind of had this detente with the South, and they let families reunite in Panmunjom or places like that. And you see brothers who haven't seen each other in 30 years, or like a dad who saw his daughter when she was six, and now she's got kids and she's like 40, and you watch them hugging, and it's just the most wonderful thing you know, on earth possible. Uh, and this was their, there's a couple things. A, they are desperately interested in reunification according to their propaganda. Uh, and B, it humanizes them. Uh, and C, it, you know, South Korea is a big sponsor of them. It's a way for them to kind of get money for them. Like, look, we're, we're giving, it's kind of this tit for tat kind of thing of de-escalating tensions. And they can easily point to this as, look, reunification is coming. Uh, it's, the, it's the wicked Americans who are keeping it uh, separated. So I encourage anyone to go on YouTube and just look for the Korean reunification and it, it'll just blow your mind. It's just wonderful. Um, but I'm wondering if, if each pairing is not monitored by a minder. Oh, they are that, monitored. Those, oh, no, no, no. Those people oh, okay. are all carefully chosen. Okay. They had someone there with them. This was not, they're okay. not going on a trip to Hawaii. They are, <laughs> and they are not, they don't, I don't think they had further contact either. It's like, oh, great, you had your moment. Mm. Come with us. Okay, so it's just a quick hug. I don't no think it was quick. I think, they had a, I think they had a day, but they, conversations permitted, but someone's standing right here. Got it, okay. Yeah. But you know what? Honestly, if you don't see your family for 40 years, uh, you, you don't need to say things that are indiscreet. You have lots to catch up on that are, that are I'm sure, completely politically acceptable to the North. And uh, as long as you say everything's great. <laughs> Why uh, would North Korea be um, excited and push reunification unless they believe that they're going to remain in power? of the entire peninsula. Well, that's exactly why. Uh, Kim Il-sung's 10-point plan, and he had a four-point plan, is, was basically some, his version of confederalism, and you have this half has their own system, this half has their own system, and then you've got the president. Gee, I wonder who that's gonna be. Um, so, you know, I, was it Klaus Fitz who said, you know, uh, politics is just war by other means, so this was just their attempt to kinda, you know, and they really do have this obsession with Korea the unified nation. So they they want it for you know genuine reasons, and you can't really blame them. Uh, and they look at you know, and the, one of the things I have him talk about in the book, which they talk about, is people think reunification is never going to happen. He points out, he goes, look at Germany, uh, look at what happened in Ireland with the peace accord. He goes, it's never too late. And and as he says, if you're saying the word impossible, you're not speaking Korean. To follow up on that, though, I mean, uh, the German example is surely apposite. Uh, I mean, the, the, the East Germany collapsed and, and became part of the Western capitalist state. So do they really believe that that's a model? I mean, clearly not. The well, they believe that it's, 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 a, it's a model in the sense that uh, Korea was united for far longer than Germany had, was. You know, Germany only became a nation in the 1800s, so it's not at all implausible. Yeah, it's going to be hard, but that uh, we'd be back together. And th they resent enormously uh, the reason they point to Germany is that as a consequence of World War II, only two nations were divided, Germany and, and, and Korea, and Korea wasn't an antagonist, so why are we the ones being separated? And Germany, who really did bad things, uh, are all unified and, and you know, uh, kind of leading Europe. I guess I was curious about the Copernicus-Columbus reference. Is that specifically geared towards Americans, or do they expect North Koreans to know it? And why don't they use Korean figures? Is it because that history is just... That is there a, is no Korea outside of Kim Jong-un and Kim Jong-un? That is a great question, because I spoke to some refugees, and they don't teach them geography. So the nations they're aware of are Korea, China, Russia, Japan, the U.S. That might be the list. Um, <laughs> so they didn't know about Hiroshima or Nagasaki. They don't teach them that. Um, well, maybe they teach them to hate Israel, because Israel, the U.S., and Japan are the axis of evil, uh, according to them. Um, so those examples, that's a very, very good question. They would not be teaching them about Copernicus uh, or Columbus in school. But it's, what's funny is, so I, there's a, Kimmel's song supposedly could teleport. One of the ways he <laughs> defeated the wicked Jap bastards was using land shrinking magic. So I spoke to a refugee, I go, was he literally teleporting? Or was this like a metaphor for like, he, oh, you know, you can never know where he's coming next. And she goes, no, no, literally. And I'm like, did they talk about how he learned to teleport? And they're like, no, he just, he can do it. You know, and she's like, I honestly believe that if he wrote his name on a piece of paper, the, the, the 
name could fly away. And I'm like, is that a function of the ink? Is the paper staying? Um, so, uh, but those stories are not translated. So she said they know that the really wacky stuff to keep internal. So they play, and also like I read a lot of books and there'll be a reference to some particularly crazy North Korean story. And then I follow the footnote to their archives and that story has been pulled. So they, they liked my book cover on Instagram. They play the West very, very well. Uh, if you convince uh, Florence King, the former National Review writer once said, she can't wait to be looked at as the crazy old lady because once you're crazy old lady, you're allowed anything. You know, no one's going to be like, what's she doing? Well, she's a crazy old lady. So if you convince everyone on Earth that you're completely crazy and can press that, that nuclear button at any moment, you really are in their heads and have a big sense of power over them because they're going to be... Who isn't scared of a crazy person? I'm scared of crazy people. Jim? Did you get any insight into what China thinks about all this? Yes, uh, so China is basically North Korea's last ally, and they have had it. Um, <laughs> but North Korea is a very Soviet nation in many ways, and just like my people, they love, uh, they kind of get off on being defiant. So a lot, all of you who are like signing Facebook petitions to tell Putin to stop gay, you know, to be for gay rights, that's really gonna get you a lot of traction in, in Russia in the other direction. Um, and so when China's like, guys, let's rein it in, they're like, no, what are you gonna do about it? And in fact, the reason the eldest son wasn't chosen as a successor is he said, we need to be more like Beijing, we need to be more like the West. Kim Jong-il saw for himself the economic miracle that happened in China, and Kim Jong-il said, absolutely not, we're not Chinese. We are sticking through the Korean Juche idea through thick and thin, and if you want openness, open a window. <laughs> the uh, big bad USSR collapsed without firing a shot. Sure. Economics and so forth. And, uh, that was a more, if I can use the term, civilized country, if, <laughs> you might say, than, than North Korea. You have a fix on their military might. I mean, I know they have rockets and stuff. And well, they, they have they the fourth biggest army on Earth. Yeah, uh, that, that's, that's fine, but you can, that's you fine. can obliterate them with a bomb. The, the question is the technology, <laughs> the, the, the nuclear and stuff. Do you, do you give much credibility to their nuclear They 100% have nukes. There's no question that they have nukes. The question is delivery, and would they fire them? I do not believe that they would fire them for Seoul. I have no doubt that they would aim for Tokyo. Uh, if they could reach the U.S., they would aim for the U.S. too. But again, for a nation that's been s suicidal and crazy, they've outlasted everybody else. So it's really so either they're really bad at being suicidal, or they're <laughs> or they're really good at something else. And my vote is for the second one. And again, part of the reason, part of what I tried to do with this book. Uh, is to get people to have understanding of, you know, they're not these crazy suicidal people. They have a coherent philosophy that doesn't work for them, but certainly maintains the regime in power, despite, you know, the rest of the world being utterly against them. Uh, one more question. Yes. How does ego and hubris relate to North Korea? <laughs> um, I also want to ask this, because in Ego and Hubris, they talk about you, it's a graphic comic book, talks about you're always being right about everything. And I'm reading this and thinking, did you really identify with your subject here? Because <laughs> he's always right. You know? I'm here and he's dead. So clearly one of us was always right and the other one wasn't. No, if you're <laughs> So for those who don't know, Harvey Pekar uh, of American Splendor fame uh, wrote a graphic novel about my life entitled Ego and Hubris, which ends on an Ayn Rand quote. Um, and it's the story, people ask me to sum it up in one sentence, and there's, there's a couple of answers. It's A, the little engine that could but shouldn't. <laughs> or it's about a young boy who thought he was better than everybody else and was. <laughs> and that one I really do believe. Because the book, but it's the... Uh, but I still got my wings. Uh, the, the reason why it's the opposite of Kim Jong-il is the book, which every uh, Las Affair books you know, referred to me as the hero of my own life. It's a series of me going against authority figures, teachers, principals, bosses, you know, who are all you know, reprehensible, awful people, and taking them down on their own terms. Uh, and this was not easy to do. Uh, and I take great pride in having the courage of my convictions when I did. 
Uh, reading the Fountainhead certainly had a lot to do with that. Uh, I, I didn't blow up a building, but you know, it, if it happened, I wouldn't be too sad about it, uh, having worked at Goldman Sachs. Um, but I never tried to force my views on other people. If you want to have different perspectives, that's fine. Go live your life. It's a very big world. This isn't North Korea. Go live anywhere you want. Just don't come to my house. <laughs> Well, dear writer, thank you very much for your insights. Thank everyone for coming. Um, uh, uh, for Research Magazine, this is John Turner's Museum of Sex. <laughs>